We have, we have nearly two dozen programs and clubs that run out of the Swartz Center. And so we thought the best way to introduce them to you would be to meet people that represent those particular programs and to hear from them about their experiences in this. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and talk about the program that they're representing. And once we get down through the, the line, then we'll open it up for questions from you all on what the programs are, okay? So we'll have people in the audience with microphones that will be able to bring the microphone to you to ask questions. Sound like a plan? Yeah. All right, Matt. All right. Start it off. Is this on? I think it is. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Mac. Um, I'm a second year MBA student at Tepper. I am representing, along with a handful of the other people sitting next to me, the GEC, the Graduate Entrepreneurship Club. My focus is in the ETA corner of the club, which is startup, or sorry, not startup, search funds, um, a little bit of private equity. ETA stands for Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition, and, and uh, we'll speak about it a little further in a bit. So happy to be here, and hopefully you guys enjoy the presentation. Hi, my name is Len Carrick, and I'm uh, here at Tepper teaching entrepreneurship through acquisition. So, you know, I am, I, I want to go back to what Dave said. Working for yourself, you'll be the happiest you can ever be. It doesn't matter. It, I've been doing, I've been fortunate all my life to be working for myself. Wow, that's all I can say. So, but I have no creativity bone in my body. So I have no idea how to invent shoes like that or any of these great products that are out there. So. I do it by uh, finding businesses that are already established, uh, usually not too exciting businesses, but go in, run the business, um, and, have, and grow the business, and, and it's just a blast. So we'll talk a little bit more about entrepreneurship through acquisition. I do have to give a plug to my classes. I have three classes that I teach, entrepreneurship alternatives, entrepreneurship through acquisitions, and entrepreneurship through acquisition workshop, where we hope to launch some people right out of Tepper to find a business to buy and grow. Hey, Len, before you move on, tell them a couple of the boring businesses that you've owned. Uh, OK, a couple of the boring businesses that I've owned. Uh, you know, what's fun about this is you learn that there's all kinds of wonderful businesses out of there. The first one I bought coming out of Tepper was uh, we re recertified propane cylinders. Uh, the next one I had was a, a fresh sausage business here in Western Pennsylvania called Uncle Charlie Sausage. We ship to seven states. And right now I have a company called the George Howe Company. We do candy, coffee, and nuts. Uh, it's based out of Grove City. It's been around since 1927. So we're coming up on our centennial. Uh, and what's, I have to say, what's very, 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 very exciting about the Howe Company is that uh, we're candy, coffee, and nuts. And the candy and nuts business is run by Francis Smith who is a graduate of Tepper. I kind of put my money where my mouth is because I tell students like you, you can run a company. So we needed somebody to be president of the company. We hired Francis uh, as he was graduating. And on Monday, uh, Jack Boyle is starting with us as president of the coffee division. Uh, Jack was a, t a classmate of Francis's. Uh, and his classmate. So it's, it's very exciting. So thank you. You do have to be a little bit nuts to do that. Uh, you, you teed it up. Hey, everybody. My name is Rob Miller. Um, just to hype up. Uh, is that Carly? Rob? <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> All right, Taru, one of our interns from the summer. She crushed it, by the way. She's joining CSL. She's great. Um, uh, Two of my classmates, yeah, Francis and Jack. Uh, Len's not kidding. We all took entrepreneurship through acquisition together. They got super excited about it. Francis, right after graduation in 2022 from the MBA, joined Len. Uh, Jack went on to consulting for a little while. Boo! <laughs> a year later, he ended up uh, joining Len, so. Yay! <laughs> I'm sorry, I could talk all day, but this is the great story. Every, anybody who's taken my class knows that I say to you, if you take my class, I'm yours forever. Just like Dave said, the Short Center is yours forever. I'm yours forever. And I get a lot of alumni, who, or I get a lot of students that go into consulting against our best wishes. And I tell them, I say, with, it'll be two years, it'll be five years, you're going to call me and say, Len, get me out of this. Jack, two months. He started in June. He called me in August and said, Len, you got to get me out of here. 
He also is calling me super stressed out, so yeah. Um, well, yeah, my name is Rob Miller. I'm here to represent the Venture Bridge Accelerator, uh, the Swartz Center Startup Accelerator. Um, about 14 uh, companies in that over the summer. We're one of them. Our company's called OTL, or Off the Line. We're creating an operating system for personal chefs to uh, one day put a personal chef into all of your homes. Uh, we're going to talk, I'll talk a little bit about what that accelerator is like. Uh, also, I'm a graduate of the MBA program here, so happy to uh, answer any questions on that front. This is, okay. Um, hi, I'm Serena. I am representing the Schwartz Fellowship. Um, I was a fellow last year, and I've been a fellow for this year as well. I also helped plan the Schwartz Trek, where we did a trip to San Francisco um, in the greater Bay Area to see tons of different companies in the area. We got to visit like the headquarters of Y Combinator, meet with lots of alum who um, owned and run different startups in the area. Uh, for my summer internship, I worked at a climate tech company called Living Carbon to make climate smart, resilient trees. Um, and so I can also happily talk about that as well. Um, and there's a few short fellows on here, but um, I'll, yeah, you can funnel any of those questions to me because they're going to be talking about other parts of the program. Thanks, Serena. <laughs> Hello, I'm Adam Knapp. I'll be uh, representing the Project Olympus Customer Discovery Program. So when I came to Pittsburgh, I sat here in this room last year, and I was like, wow, I have this really, really cool idea, but where do I go? How do I make it a product? What's next? So I was at a wedding, and I was just like, I, I talked to my family, talked to my brother, and I had been looking at, at some of the programs, and I kept on seeing this customer discovery Kickstarter that Project Olympus had. I kept on seeing it, and I was just like, you know what? Why would I wait until next semester when I think I might have more time? Why don't I just do it now? So I went, I applied, uh, met some of the team over there, and they said, hey, you should do this thing to learn about, is this really a problem? So I went, I talked to a bunch of churches and other small parking lot owners and learned my idea in its original form was wrong, but in a new form was actually pretty good. But I would not have known anything unless I went and started talking to people. And they're the ones that can help get you started and take your idea from just this thing in your mind or even research that you're doing to an actual product. So they have an information session that's gonna be this coming Monday. You can see some QR codes they have on their table out there and I'll feel free to ask any questions. Yeah, thanks Adam. Uh, I think Adam mentioned uh, research, and uh, I represent a program here called Innovation Commercialization Fellowship Program. And um, again, my name is Fei Fei. I am uh, currently a Tepper MBA student. I work in uh, Department of Biology in Mellon Institute doing research, and this program helped turn a university research into uh, a commercial venture. Uh, company. And um, I think one of the challenges and a common mistake for a smart engineer is to build something that shouldn't be existed or uh, nobody want. And I think this program really helped us to rethink what customer need, push us to go out of the building and ask our customer to find the product market fit and test the viability of the business model. And if you're also working on a very amazing uh, scientific research here in CMU, I think this program is for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah. Before you move on, this particular program is targeted at CMU-owned IP, meaning that research that goes on in the laboratories from faculty members, PhDs, postdocs, master's students, right? It's helping to get that technology out of the university and turned into a company. So if you're a PhD, a postdoc, or you're a graduate student working in a lab that's working on CMU-owned IP, this is the program for you. By the way, even though it turned out we were skewed to Tepper today, at the first few people, this is not just Tepper. This is every school on campus, the College of Fine Arts, Dietrich, the Mellon College of Sciences, the School of Engineering, right? Computer Science. So you'll hear some other students from those other programs. Adam is a really interesting case. He didn't tell you his background. He's at the Heinz School, but he's also active military. So, you know, despite whatever your circumstances are, you can pursue an entrepreneurial path. So thanks. We can pass to the next person. Awesome. Hello, everyone. I am Sai Sri Akundi. <laughs> thanks. I, I'm guessing that's Taru. <laughs> um, 
I am second year MIP student. Um, it's Masters of Integrated Innovation in Products and Services at the Integrated Innovation Institute. And today I'm representing the McGinnis Venture Competition. Um, I have taken advantage of so many programs at the Swartz Center, starting from the Connect series to the Graduate Entrepreneurship Clubs, Hack a Startup, to the McGinnis Venture Competition, and I continue to take advantage of so many resources at the SWAT Center. It is such, such um, an amazing community, um, starting from the entrepreneur in residence, these amazing EIRs who, have, who are part of our advisory board have helped us in so many different circumstances building my company. Um, I am one of the co-founders for Diesel, uh, we are building a smart insole which monitors and prevents diabetic foot complications like ulcers in diabetic patients. Um, and I'm going to cover a whole lot about a, a, a common question which we all have. How do you find the right people for your team? Um, how did you go forward with your customer discovery? Um, how did Connect Series actually help you out? And this is such a long journey towards McGinnis and McGinnis itself has been such an amazing experience for us going through those rounds, the network that we've built, the amazing feedback that we got, uh, which made us pivot our ideas so many times. And um, the mentors who are part of McGinnis are part of our advisory and they continue to support us. So I'm gonna be covering all, more about McGinnis and some, something more about the uh, other programs like Connect Series that I took advantage of as well. Yeah, the Connect series, which starts next Wednesday, uh, usually runs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday during the lunch hour here. And we have a special track for people that want to participate in McGinnis, a series of wor six workshops that will get you prepared for McGinnis. Hey, Zeiser, I have a question for you before we pass it on. Yes. What, what new thing just happened to you this week? <laughs> we got a startup garage Woo! Uh, with an amazing view. Uh, so What's a startup garage? Oh. So startup garages are for, com sorry, I don't need a mic, but startup garages are um, office spaces for companies to help you build your team, have a space to work together, imagine all those things. So um, spaces for you to work together, and um, we're just in these amazing accelerator programs, and having that office space, we have interns now as well, so having an office space where all of us can connect, meet together, is just so helpful. Yeah, uh, the guys in the back really want us to speak into the microphone so that we get this recorded. So I know, I know, Zizri, you don't need a microphone, <laughs> but we need to have one. So uh, you get to work on your startups in good space. We have space right here at the Schwartz Center. And then you see that brown apartment building over there, the Fairfax, right across the street is the Project Olympus uh, uh, office space there. And they have, garage, they have offices and garages and conference rooms there. So there is plenty of space for you guys to work on your startups. We'll explain that through the Q&A. Thanks. Next. So that was actually a great segue because we are a startup that's working with Project Olympus. So my name is Shreyas, we're with Rento GPT. So like most of you guys, we were students last semester looking for a house uh, for this semester. But with all the schoolwork and stuff, it was pretty draining to find something. And that's when ChatGPT came out. So we were joking around one afternoon saying, what if we got ChatGPT to find a house for us? And that's actually how the idea was born. So Rento GPT gives a chat style interface where you can talk about all of your preferences, list things out, have it scour property data for you and bring back all of the relevant listings. So um, it makes the whole process a little bit faster and easier. Um, one big thing is, as students, we sometimes have unique preferences, right? Like wanting to be near a bus stop that gets to campus faster, or LA Fitness if you have a membership there, or something like that. Usually these are things you have to look for manually, but with Google Maps' uh, API, we're hoping to accommodate for these location preferences as well. The other cool thing is um, everyone hates messaging realtors for scheduling tours, following up with them when they don't reply, things like that. So with Generative AI, we hope to send email, auto automate the whole process of emailing realtors, doing all of that for you so you don't have to. Project Olympus has been great for us because we have an advisor named Laura um, who's launched things herself and she helps us validate the idea and tells us what questions to ask with user interviews and make sure we're actually solving a problem. And the cool thing is she also helps us with our go-to-market strategy, 
helping us have a social media presence before we launch, uh, things like that. So they've been fantastic. And Project Olympus has also helped us connect with real estate industry leaders so we can get their opinions on things and actually talk to experts in the field. They have experts in all different fields too, um, like finance, medical, things like that. And uh, I know the customer discovery kickstart was mentioned. Uh, it's something I'd really look into because they make you do 20 user interviews and uh, really help you validate the idea and test the prototype uh, before even applying for grants and things like that. So uh, really grateful to be here and just uh, only question is who's next uh, to join Project Olympus. Uh, Shreya, before you go, so Shreya said that you need to get to campus faster. Have mom and dad buy some moonwalkers for you, right? <laughs> Three times faster, just walking the same. Thank you. We've got to get a plug in for our startups. Great. Next birthday gift can be Uber credits. So. There you go. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Ipsita Praraj. I'm working with him. I'm a student at CMU MISM here. And the conversation actually started with our tea sessions. And uh, basically, we were enthusiasts working with LLMs. And finally, when we just Filled our form, the form was so easy, like we just randomly wrote the ideas and then it just asked you, do you think this makes sense? And we just filled the form and then we got into the program, it was so easy. And the second part is that uh, we thought that we had just Google form and getting the answers ready and from the customers. But Laura helped us understand these customers, these people who fill the form can also be your customers. So that kind of business sense was missing in us and uh, then we had a guesstimate of the numbers and the revenue that we could get from our product. Laura also helped us understand that uh, you should go from ground up, not from top to bottom. We, used to, we basically generally do like a market study from all the reports, but that's not how you do it in real life. So that kind of thing that was missing in our team was like a part of Paul Tempers uh, mentorship. Yeah, thank you. Hello, yeah. Hi guys, um, so Ipsita here mentioned LLMs and I thought that was my cue to step in. I am a second year AI student at SCS and I'm pursuing my master's. Um, I'm also a Corporate Startup Lab Fellow, and I'm here to represent the Corporate Startup Lab. I have been a fellow for a year, and I've had an amazing opportunity to work with um, big, large-scale companies like Moderna, Shell, and SVB to kind of figure out how they're implementing AI innovation cycles within their organizations. Apart from that, I'm also working with Honda this semester as um, a CSL Fellow again to kind of find out how can they integrate LLMs within their navigation systems to kind of enhance mobility experiences? Um, I am happy to answer any questions with, uh, about CSL programs that we have here, which is the CSL project course, the CSL fellowship, as well as the CSL forum on uh, applied innovation in artificial intelligence. That would be happening um, in November, I guess. So yeah, I've probably, um, I've, I see a few familiar faces here, and I'm happy to answer any questions about processes um, when it comes to applying for the CSL fellowship or just how to participate and be a part of like these forums and the various CSL events. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Avishek Shah. I'm also a master's student at the Information Systems Management Program. I'm here to represent the CSL Spring course as well as the CSL fellowship. Uh, so to get started with, what actually led me to CSL was when I came to CMU, I wanted experiential learning to be a big part of my curriculum. And CSL was the perfect way to do that. CSL uh, can be considered to be an interdisciplinary group of people who come and help innovate within big corporations. So here you have that startup culture, startup mindset, but you're, estab you're implementing all of that in well-established companies. So it's like the perfect blend of both worlds. I'll be happy to answer any questions about the CSL Spring course, the CSL Fellowship, and uh, any upcoming CSL activities, including the forum, there's a case competition, and interactive workshops that will be happening in November. Great. Are we down to the end of the line? I can't see. We've got so many damn programs, I can't see the end. Uh, uh, just uh, So what we're going to do now is move to a and a to allow you to ask questions. But just as a reminder of the programs that were re represented, Corporate Startup Lab you just heard from. Uh, the, the uh, Project Olympus Probe program, the Project Olympus Grad Customer Discovery Kickstarter, uh, the Innovation Commercialization Fellows program, which targets university-owned IP to be commercialized into companies, the Swartz Fellowship, which is targeted professional masters from programs across the university, uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition, which we heard from uh, Mac and, and Len, uh, Venture Bridge, uh, which we heard uh, from uh, Rob, and I think those are the programs that, oh, and, and the McGinnis Venture Competition and Connects Workshops that we heard from Sizery. Actually, it's, it's interesting because when Rob, Rob is an alum now, he was a Swartz Fellow. 
Serena represents Schwartzfellow. Adam's a Schwartzfellow from the Heinz School. Uh, Zeisery's a Schwartzfellow from MIPS, which is an interdisciplinary program between engineering, design, and business. So uh, you can ask any of those uh, folks questions about the Schwartz Fellowship as well. So with that said, let's raise our hand and we'll pick somebody to answer the ask the first question. What, ready to back? All right, take, get, got a microphone, so we'll wait for the microphone. Sonia, back there. Yeah. This is, hello, this is directed to the Schwartz Fellow. Do you have to have a startup background to be part of the Schwartz Fellowship? Okay, so um, you do not need to have a startup or entrepreneurship background in order to be a Schwartz Fellow. It is a phenomenal program where Anyone with an interest in entrepreneurship, it is not simply a start your own company. I am definitely an advocate of working for a startup versus working for a big organization. You just have to have a passion and a genuine interest in entrepreneurship to be a Schwartz Fellow. Um, if anything, not having a background in entrepreneurship is even more helpful because the Schwartz Fellowship is full of a ton of different diverse backgrounds uh, and of people from different industries. Um, and so it's really like non-homogenous and we want as many diverse and interesting applicants as possible. The applications for the Schwartz Fellowship are due October 15th, Sonia, did I get that right? Yeah, so, and there's a flyer out in the front table if you, if you want to get some more information or you go to the website. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic program. We have over 200 Swartz Fellows that have uh, gone through the program over time, and some of them have done just amazing, amazing things. Can I add just one piece to that on not needing a startup background? You don't need a startup background for anything in the Swartz Center. Just, I know that's a pretty common question for the GEC, for everyone, for Swartz Fellowship, CSL, uh, Project Olympus, whatever it is, you don't need a startup background for, for any of that stuff. Um, I also wanted to add something. Um, continuing on that point, um, the way Swartz Fellowship has helped me is to find my co-founder. So a team building, especially uh, coming from different backgrounds, we all have our individual skills and we're such a such a close cohort of individuals who help each other um, in your entrepreneurial journey. As Serena just mentioned, you don't need to have a background in entrepreneurship, but it's such a great place to start your entrepreneurial journey. May I also add something? Um, so I think the coolest part about my program is also the diverse uh, a background that each individual um, ICF fellow bring to the table. We have someone working on haptic glove for a metaverse. We have um, some of the fellow, you know, working on non-invasive uh, pressure sensing technologies for measuring the intro uh, cranial pressure. You know, like we also have someone working on non-invasive uh, chronic pain management, pain alley. Um, medical device. We also have someone from, uh, you know, mechanical engineering background, uh, building, you know, fabricating nanostructured films for uh, using electronics to improve um, performance. So it's really the very diverse background everyone b bring to this uh, ecosystem in the small center that make the small center better. So I don't think it's really the entrepreneurial uh, background that's differentiate us, but really what uh, we're passionate about that we bring together and make us different. Right. Question right up here, Andrew. Uh, what's the wait, 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 we gotta we got get it recorded. So can someone hand him a microphone? Yeah. Thanks. What's the difference between the Swartz Fellowship and the CSL Fellowship, and how do I know which one's right for me? I did both <laughs> the fellowships, so I think uh, I can answer this question, and please uh, feel free to add on. Um, so Swartz Fellowship specifically, so there are different types of entrepreneurship, and I think one of the Connect series is also about different types of entrepreneurship, which you should definitely attend. Um, one, for Swartz Fellowship, it's more about the entrepreneurial background of being a founder. Or, or I would, I would say that's wrong because we also have, um, we also have fellows who are interested in working at startups and taking startups forward. Um, it's both, and corporate uh, startup lab focuses more on how do you bring entrepreneurship in a company setting. 
that you're directly working with organizations here, which gives you an idea of how do you manage bureaucracy in a company? <laughs> how, do you, um, how do you understand, um, how do you work in teams? How does collaboration happen? Um, starting from um, the, starting from user studies to building a, a business for a company to building go-to-market strategies, especially on a company project. So there's a problem statement which is given to you at the CSL that you keep um, with your team that you keep exploring and you work further with. Swartz Fellowship, on the other hand, every Friday we have um, a series with a seminar series with either an entrepreneur or a VC, and they talk about their journeys, inspire you, motivate you to pursue entrepreneurship or to help you understand how it is working at a startup. So that's a major difference. And then obviously we have uh, the Silicon Valley Trek uh, for the Swartz Fellowship, which is just amazing. Uh, we all bonded there and um, yeah, so these are the two major differences. Please feel free to add on. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so for the Schwartz Fellowship, I would say also a major part is you work for or you're starting a startup. Um, and in a corporate startup lab, um, one of my mentors comes from a corporate startup lab for, through the Schwartz Fellowship. She works for, um, it's Emily, she works for, what is it, Dave? It's called Store, store Number 8, it's yeah. Store number. So Store Number 8 is like the corporate startup lab that's in Walmart. And so basically it works th inside Walmart to come up with new innovations for that company, where for a startup, you are kind of just like charting your own path, looking for your own industry. So like I'm really into climate technology and carbon removal. And so there's a lot of different types of startups that are focused focusing in that there. And so it's definitely a more like choose your own adventure kind of route versus a corporate startup lab is like sort of a bit more like self-directed and like, I don't know, the trade-off is like one is like, like better funded, but you have a bit more restrictions. The other one is like, you could be working for like the next Uber or like the next Google. So it's like, it can really hit like a giant trajectory. Um, prior to coming to Tepper, um, I'm a business student here. I've actually been pretty much working exclusively in startups and co have collected equity over about three different startups that I've worked for and two of them have gone public. Um, so like, you know, and some so if of you need a loan, Serena. And some some of them some of them are not doing so great right now. I got on LinkedIn and saw some of them are doing some layoffs. So like you know there are there are some good bets and there are also some bad bets too. All right, Serena needs a loan. <laughs> I can I can I can talk a lot about that. Got the microphone, please. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So uh, the two major differences that I'd highlight are the scale of impact and the way you navigate through these fellowships. So uh, at the CSL Fellowship, when we are talking about the scale of impact, these are big organizations. These are companies like Optum, Honda, and all of them. So when we uh, do some market sizing activities, the numbers go up to millions or often billions as well. So that's the scale of impact that uh, whatever innovative solutions you'll be coming up with, you'll be impacting that value. Apart from that, uh, she mentioned a very interesting term about the bureaucracy that you navigate through. So when you go through CSL Fellowship, you understand how things happen at big corporations. It's not very easy to often get the data that you want. It's not very easy to uh, get your point through all the stakeholders that are involved. So that's a major difference. There's always a good learning to it. Yeah, yeah um, I would like to discuss the how of the CSL Fellowship. You are partnered with an organization or a big corporate and you are given a prompt which might have a defined scope or an undefined scope, right? Once you have that prompt, you have stakeholders from that organization or the particular sponsor that you have. You meet with those stakeholders weekly or bi-weekly and you navigate the problem with them, right? And I think one more thing about the corporate startup lab that, and the fellowship that I personally felt was the deliverable is after doing all the research, market research, let's say um, I'm designing a go-to-market strategy or something, is my personal opinion or my recommendation to these executives. These, ha these executives have been in the game for so long. They're experts, right? They're leading big, co big corporations. I, as a student from Carnegie Mellon, and as a student representing CSL, why are they interested in me? It's probably trying, me trying to use a fresh perspective or whatever the uh, latest research that I have done to offer a recommendation to these executives. So imagine, I remember my first uh, meeting, uh, I think Sean was there as well, Sean Amirati. 
And um, I was in this particular room, uh, conference room, with uh, exact CXOs from Moderna. And I, I asked Sean, is it, is it OK, whatever I'm talking, do I, do I even know as much as these experts do? But imagine the kind of power you have to um, have a conversation with these uh, executives, right? And I think that was a big takeaway for me. Great. Um, so there's some Swartz Center uh, employees that I like to point out. Jim Jen, can you stand up there in the back? Jim is the director of the Corporate Startup Lab. Sean Emmer, uh, Sean Emmer, Sean Mawinney uh, here is a program manager. Uh, Hallie Johnson, who some of you that are in this uh, CSL program has met, is not here with us today. For the Swartz Fellowship, Sonia is the program manager. Uh, if you have any questions, they'll be willing to help. Just one last analogy, the difference between the Swartz Fellowship and the CSL Fellowship. The Swartz Fellowship is more like a sorority or a fraternity experience, right? It's a it's cohort, you know, we want you to be a part of that for life. The, the CSL fellowship is more like a paid internship, right? To get to work with executives in the company. You get paid to do really cool projects and it's like a three month interview, right? It's pretty cool, so. Okay. Next question. Okay, question over here. Can I borrow a, a mic? Oh, you got there. Thank you, hi, I'm Emily, first year MBA student. Um, very interested in entrepreneurship. One thing that I'm trying to do is have as many conversations with as many people as possible. So is there any kind of internal network or any facilitation of like those connections with people that have different Graduate talents? Entrepreneurship Club. Right, Nicholas? Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that, so, um, so when I came to the MBA uh, orientation, like the very first thing that everybody in this room that's a graduate student should do is join the Graduate Entrepreneurship Club because it's a diverse group of people from across campus to actually do exactly what you're talking about. The Swartz Center, you know, we're the, history, the history of programs. We know what students want every year in and year out, but the Graduate Entrepreneurship Club does personalized programming for the cohort that year, and every year it's different. So it's a really great place to go and network to get started. A shameless plug for Hack a Startup by the Graduate Entrepreneurship Club. Hack a Startup is a great event where you pitch a problem. You don't need to come with your own uh, problem statement. There are people who will pitch and you can form teams. A great way of um, just exploring uh, starting a company in, um, yeah, by hacking it in two weeks. Um, such an amazing uh, program which I took advantage of at the Graduate Entrepreneurship Club. It's happening in October and you will see uh, notifications and flyers for it soon. So please participate. Also, the Corporate Startup Week happening in November, there you'll have the opportunity to network as well as, um, as, well as there's a case competition, uh, which is sponsored by PNC. It's about financial equity. So graduate students here can also participate and network through that while you participate through it. Great. Anybody else have any uh, suggestions on how she can network? Connect series. Connect series, yeah. At the Connect series, what we do, uh, it, it's a, we bring an alumni in usually or an expert to talk about any topic that you would need to understand as an entrepreneur. But at the beginning, we allow the, the attendees to stand up and talk about whatever startup that you're working on and, and ask that you need help in marketing or you need help in engineering. And if you don't have your own startup, you can say, hey, I'm an engineer or I'm a social media specialist and I like these kinds of industries. It's a way you can find people that uh, we've had, uh, uh, we kind of refer to it as startup dating. We've had a lot of startup dating there. The first date is they meet at a Connects workshop series and then they go have coffee chats. And if the chemistry is there, they swap spit. I mean, they, they become co-founders. Uh, so there's a, a really great opportunity to, to, to find people that way. I think that yeah. went over a lot of people's heads. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Next question. Um, Actually, hi. can I add quickly to Yeah, the sure, question? sure. Um, I think Project Olympus, like just piggybacking off of everyone else, is also a good place to meet people because um, one, the advice as aspect of it, like uh, different industry leaders, you know, they'll help you get connected with them to ask questions and advisors from Carnegie Mellon too. But the cool thing is they also do have connections with investors and things like that, right? So if you're interested in that aspect of taking an idea and actually making it a reality, that's really where you may meet people that can help you on that path. Uh, just wanted to add that too. Great. Okay, we have a question right um, here. Hi, I have a question, and I have the mic as well. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sonia, you got, you, got, you got to let me know that they have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, um, actually I wanted to ask, um, if you somehow don't get into any of these programs, you know, let's say you identify a program that you want to get into and you don't get through the selection process, if, and if you're still very passionate about entre entrepreneurship, how do you then engage with SWART Center? Yeah, let, let, let me take that one and then anybody can sort of add on. So uh, a few of these programs are competitive, right? The Corporate Startup Lab Fellows Program is competitive. The, the SWART Fellows is competitive. We usually only have about 12 to 15 slots. So, so they're not the end all be all. They're, they're great programs, they're wonderful, but the Swartz Center will help you in whatever path that you want to, to work on. So we have uh, folks that are called Entrepreneurs in Residence. Leah, can you stand up? Leah is one of our newest Entrepreneurs in Residence. She's a graduate of the Heinz School. She started 412 Food Rescue and Food Rescue Hero. Um, we connect everybody that comes to the Swartz Center with an Entrepreneur in Residence to understand what you're interested in and help chart a path help you get mentors, help you understand which programs that you should take advantage of that are not competitive, like the McGinnis Venture Competition. Everybody gets to participate in that. It, it's a three round. We've had 80 startups in round number one, gets paired down to about 40 in round number two and down to about 15 in round number three. So, so you know, there's so many things that you can take advantage of uh, that aren't part of per competitive programs. Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah, Matt. I'll, additionally, this is, I guess, uh, restating what was already said. The GEC is open to every single graduate program. It's not Tepper exclusive. It's not, you know, another program exclusive. So at a bare minimum, just, you know, membership in that club will get you exposure to various competitions that exist, um, students that are like-minded, anything. That's, you know, a, a very simple first step in, in order to help you navigate where you ultimately want to end up at. Thanks, thanks. The other thing I want to add, and I, I try to get this across to students, is that the Carnegie Mellon alumni and, it, and the Tepper alumni are, are a great group. And once you have a CMU uh, address, you can tap into the directory. So if you have a question or, you, or you're interested in something or you want to network, just go on there and you could search various things, like look for presidents of company. And of course, if something comes up like General Electric, well, you can cross that one out. But go to, you know, if you find these obscure company names, you know, look at their website. And if it looks interesting, just send that person an email. The, the Carnegie Mellon alumni is just an amazing group. And they listen and they, and they want to they wanna help. So just do that as well. And then a little piggyback on Project Olympus side, um, they have a whole host of domain experts that are open and available to everybody in that program. So for example, with the company that I uh, you know, started, uh, I needed somebody who was an expert in nonprofit real estate tax. Where do I go to find someone like that? Project Olympus domain experts. And all of the Project Olympus startups, which all you have to do is apply, will have access to that. Uh, adding into that and, and what Len said, I promise you in a year from now, if you're a new student or second year student, um, and I think this goes back to the question around like networking and all of that, um, like 99% of students won't end up reaching out to that directory. I promise you though, if you do it, everyone will ask, oh my gosh, how did you hire this person? Or you know, how'd you find this advisor? How'd you get your first investor? cmu.edu truly cold calling everyone thinks like you have to have the connection or you have to have you know the the first degree relationship it's at cmu.edu hey i'm so and so i'm working on this you know we're raising this capital or i'm a student right now and i'm doing this 80 percent of the time you're going to get a response you're going to get a coffee chat and it just comes down to like how much energy you want to put into that outreach um but Everyone in here is your network, and everyone who's graduated is your network. Uh, I don't think I'm uh, directly answer the question, but I think part of it is if you apply once, you didn't get in, just apply again. Uh, that doesn't apply to some of the fellowship that you you would be only have one chance. But I think uh, in terms of some of the accelerators, even in like pitch competitions we were not be able to get into the finals round, but we were be able to get into the next year. So I think every rejection is opportunity, and I think uh, maintain the relationship, get the intro, um, really listen carefully with the feedback, kind of pivoting 
um, based on the feedbacks and refine the strategies and just apply again. I think a lot of times it will definitely get a much better uh, success rate the, the, the next time. I also wanted to add that some of the courses, electives, which are at um, Tepper, um, I have taken Lean Entrepreneurship. Meredith Grelly teaches it. Such an amazing course. Um, I took Diesel, my company, to so many electives, entrepreneurial electives, and that has been very helpful for me. Um, next mini, there is um, an elective called Funding Early Stage Ventures. Frank Demler teaches it. Oh my God, it is such an amazing course. So you can take you can take advantage of some of the electives as well to build your companies, and it's a great way of forming teams because all the projects in these specific uh, courses are team-based. And um, yeah, um, uh, I am very bad when it comes to finances. Lean Entrepreneurship, Tepper students have helped me so much building an amazing revenue model and getting our initial finances right. It's been, it's been such an amazing journey. So yeah, take advantage of your courses as well. Seal it off. Okay, uh, I just had one point that, okay, hang around SWATS because SWATS is also home to a lot of innovation that happens around Pittsburgh. Last semester we had this exchange PGH program and I cannot count the number of ideas that might have come out of it. It was a very simple program. It was for people who were very new to entrepreneurship. They came in, we did a lot of activities which also involved clay modeling. So stuff like this happens at SWATS. So just hang around, you'll get to know about these programs. All right, so I have two questions. Uh, one is like you mentioned that the CSL fellowship and the sports fellowship is very competitive. So like, is there something in particular that you look at the applicant's profile? So, you know, to get into the CSL fellowship or the sports fellowship? So for the Schwartz fellowship, I would recommend for your application, uh, what are you bringing to the table that is different than everyone else? Just what what is it? What do you care about? What do you want to do? You don't need to have like a five step plan or something, but like what are you bringing to the table as yourself, your personality, your background, but then also like what can you do for the Schwartz Center that they're not already doing? So my background was in chemistry and physics before I came to CMU and I'm a business student. Um, and we have a lot of tech at CMU, but we don't have as much science connections. And so that was something I really leaned into in my application that was really important to me was expanding that network and then also that uh, I leaned into the fact that I want to be a person who wants to work for startups, not found my own company, and that is something that I believe did differentiate me in my application as well. On the point of differentiation, um, for the CSR fellowship, I think what I've observed so far, it's a two-way street, what you bring to the t table and what CSL has to offer to you as well. So it's a, essentially a matching process where you're matched with one of the sponsors, Let's say there's a sponsor in retail and you have some experience working in retail or maybe you're passionate to work in retail, right? So that uh, that match is really important and it's, um, yes, you need to bring interest on the table, passion on the table and maybe a few relevant experiences, let's say, but I think that match is what kind of differentiates you. Um, to add to it, uh, so the CSL fellowship interview was one of my most uh, was one of the most interesting experiences that I've had. If you all re uh, read the prompt this year, it was you had to create a presentation about the thing that is most important to you in your life. Okay, So that was a prompt that made me think for days. I had to come up with the right idea that would be the perfect balance between something uh, personal, but also express how I can bring something to the company. So prompts like this, and then there was a video recording with some interesting prompt questions as well. Uh, so after you complete these prompts, you submit your application, then there's an interview with one of the program managers. They get to know more about you, they uh, tell you more about the companies that are coming this year. And then, yeah, as she mentioned, you need to they need to find the right match for you uh, for matching you to the right company. So uh, the, inter the interview experience that I had for CSL Fellowship was one of the most interesting things at CMU that I've been with.
probably going to really tick off all the other Swartz fellows on here uh, with their calendars. But truly, if you're interested in the Swartz Fellowship, reach out to Swartz Fellow alumni. Um, ask for time on their calendar. Uh, it gets noticed. The Swartz Fellows talk to Sonia. They talk to Dave um, from cohorts ago, a decade plus. So reach out, network with Swartz Fellows, ask them questions, do your research. We really try to get diversity across all of the schools gender diversity, ethnicity diversity, country of origin diversity, lifestyle diversity. Diversity is really an important part of the Swartz Fellows. So, uh, you know, just keep that in mind and, and talk about how you're different. Um, okay, so I still have here. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, basically, we don't have any company idea, but we are interested in working for startups. Even then, we can take advantage of the Swartz Fellowship or the Swartz Center? Yes. All right. And like uh, someone told me that if I do have an idea and I wanted to work on it further, then there's something that tables assigned to you that you can come to the SWAT Center, work on it. So what exactly is yeah, that? Yeah, so we, we have, remember, the Project Olympus uh -huh. building is right over there. And then this space that you're in today, both are available for you to work out of. Okay. At, at, the, at this space in particular, we have three levels. When you have your first idea, we have tables that are first come, first serve. There's lots of them. So you can come and work at those tables. If you're dedicated and you're coming in every day, we can get you your dedicated table. You'll have your company name on it. You can leave your things because the doors are locked 24 seven. And the companies that are making the most progress, like Diesel just got into one of our 10 startup garages. Right. Can someone pass a uh, mic to Kit so she can actually uh, talk about what the process uh, for? Adam. Kit Natum with Project Olympus. Uh, we were the original space um, back in 2007 when we were formed, and our building is literally where I sit was an old horse stable. So uh, this is new, bright, clean, and shiny, and um, Alex does an awesome job of keeping that way. Not so much over at Olympus. Um, we put things on the walls. We punch holes in the walls. We have knocked down walls. Uh, so there is space we have, just like Dave said, anybody can walk in, it's common space. We have the Wi-Fi, we have coffee, we have printers, we have four conference rooms you can sign up for, we have an event space you can book yourself and just hold, it holds up to 50 people. Uh, and so, uh, but it's not new and bright and shiny. It's, it's old and funky, but we have space too. I just say though, for if you're a current student, it actually makes sense because this is close and it's real easy to get in between classes to come over and work for a while. We're not far. We're just right over, as Dave said, where that brown building is, but it's a little bit further. So we have a lot of alumni that are working in our space. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. There we go. OK. Uh, I am really curious how you would recommend graduate students go about assessing if we want our entrepreneurial journey to parallel our graduate research or if we want to branch out beyond that sphere of research. I think uh, one of the starting place would be uh, starting from a, a, a Project Olympus. and probably talking to your customers to see if you can see a market, uh, market there. You will, you will feel um, there is a need when you talk to your customer. You will realize there is a pain point there. And once that's there, it's become a simpler question for you because you basically I figure out in terms of your business model canvas the desirability of potential a new business. And then the rest of the work is continue with your customer discovery in terms of really finding that pattern, the signal over, vo uh, signal over noise, in terms of finding the real uh, market needs. And then like, you can continuously uh, working on a business model canvas in terms of like feasibility side, uh, you know, like back, uh, behind the scene kind of the operation wise, the milestones, different like resources you need and also like, whether the revenue cost structure, whether the uh, juice was used to squeeze, right? But I think the first starting point is really to evaluate if there is a desirability around your research, whether there is a need that potentially your solution is addressing a real problem. But I think once you figure that out, it becomes much easier. 
So we'll tell you like how we thought of going about it. So we got, I got rejected in CSL, but uh, Project Olympus, the form was simple and the cohort was in the summers. So that's when you have a little bit more time compared to your classes. So we got into it and it was a weekly call with our mentor. And uh, I, we joined it because uh, we were a group of five people who were not able to give good enough amount of time to work on this idea because we all were tech oriented and we didn't know like how to start, how to approach the EVC or anything. We had a Google form res responses from our customers. We didn't know what to do with it. So uh, we went to our mentor and we showed that we had the results. We don't know if it makes sense. They made us redo the form. They made us rechange the questions and ask only very select few of people. And from that response, we got our numbers of uh, what is the price we have to charge our customers. So that kind of weekly accountability that Project Unlumpers made us do, we ended up making our own domain. We ended up making a uh, website by the process of just talking to the mentor and feeling like, OK, we have to show something, we have to show something. So that free time and their uh, constant eye on us, like, uh, have you done this? Have you thought of that? And have you approached colleges for your tie-ups? And then giving us the contact to go and talk to them and previous Project Olympus winners, park grant owners. So that kind of uh, gave us confidence and kind of made us less nervous. So um, that's a good place to start and try if it makes sense. That's what I'm saying. Like, and Project Olympus, I feel, is a very easy place to start if you don't have any clue. Like, we were like that, so I think, and we are having like a domain set up and we can share the QR code with you like, to see our product. But yeah, we were very clueless when we started. Yeah. All right, we're going to get a couple more questions in, so you're next. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, I am a first-year master's student in engineering. My program is about a year and a half, and it's kind of packed with classes. How do you guys uh, recommend like going about finding the balance between these fellowships, or if not the fellowships, the um, different, if you would just go straight into making your own startup with the Hack a Startup program, how are you finding the balance between doing classes and then also uh, working on that part? So I'll, I'll take this. Um, really you will never have enough time. That's bottom line. So the question now is, am I gonna do it? Am I just gonna send it? And then, hey, I might not be able to work on it at all this week because I have four projects due. Okay, well, next week, I'll work on it. I'll find time. Uh, and then later on in your coursework, you might have more flexibility, and then you can do stuff where, oh, this course, you know, maybe in Tepper, maybe in somewhere else, it has a project that's a free-form project. I can go take this course and work on my company at the same time. So I've been able to do that a lot more personally this semester, and I'm sure a lot of other people can attest that there are opportunities in your CMU coursework to not only get experts, but also get team members to work on your idea. I think uh, I was just talking to Dave about this in one of our advisory sessions. Uh, um, a big thing is brutal prioritization. And it's a good time to learn it while you're in grad school, especially if you have, well, any aspirations for any career, whether it be entrepreneurial or in the corporate environment. Um, brutally prioritizing your schedule is, um, it's a great thing. I guess I say this to grad students more than um, undergrads, right? Don't, don't necessarily just treat this experience as coming back for like another version or another go at your undergraduate degree for partying and all of that. Like have fun, have a good time, but take it a little bit more seriously as well. Um, you will get strides ahead of the competition, um, but brutal prioritization. Uh, you know, you're gonna wanna do everything. Um, there's a million clubs you can join. There's a million opportunities, but really taking a step back and, and saying like, what is gonna help me you know, further my career, what is also something I'm really excited about maybe in my personal life, and try and narrow that down to a few things outside of class that you can pour a lot of time into, rather than being like really thinly spread across a lot of things. Um, narrow it down to, you know, one or two things that you're just gonna pour tons of time into, dedicate tons of time into, and you'll get, you'll get a lot more out of it. I'll add real quick to make this brief. Um, Half of that battle is coming to a conclusion where you're confident that you're prioritizing the right things. And again, just come to the Schwartz Center, meet people, you'll find a mentor, you'll find guidance. And, and if you are having trouble identifying what you think you should prioritize, you can lean on any of these resources to arrive at that answer. Only two things matter at Carnegie Mellon, getting in and getting out. <laughs> And guess what? They want you to get out because they want your tuition. No one's going to ask you about your grades. I'm not saying don't go to class and don't study. You should go to class, you should study, you should learn. But don't sweat the grades, right? Spend the time 
networking. Networking is the most important thing that you can do in your graduate program here. And this is the best networking place for you at Carnegie Mellon, the Schwartz Center, because we connect you not only to students across campus, but we connect you to alumni that can do amazing things. Just one quick story. Jody Madala, she was a, a, a part-time online hybrid uh, student in the MBA program. Uh, during COVID, she had an idea that the future of work was going to change, and she came up with that idea, but she needed a beta customer. And I said, well, who would, what company would be your dream customer? She said, Home Depot. The CEO of Home Depot is a Carnegie Mellon alum. I, showed him, I, I wrote him a note. He became her first customer. That's the kind of networking and the power of networks that you will find here at Carnegie Mellon. All right. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Get up, stretch your legs. You can come ask some individual questions. 